thank you very much. Um, uh, those many years of experience in the police makes me sound really, very, very old. And that's why I'm going to take you now back to the past, to the year, I just try this thing, 1981. I hope all of you were born that, that year, or was already born. <laughs> so, um, yes, 1981 was a very interesting year for the internet. It was the year that um, IP version 4 was first used in the public, um, as a public protocol. And I recently came across a very interesting article that was published where they forecast how crime is going to be in the future. And I would like to share it with you. Computers will make the world of tomorrow a much safe place. They will do away with cash so that you need no longer fear being attacked for your money. In addition, you need not worry that your home will be burglared or your car stolen. The computers in your home and car will guard them, allowing only yourself to enter or someone with your permission. However, there is one kind of crime which may exist in the future, computer crime. Instead of mugging people in the streets or robbing houses, tomorrow's criminal may try to steal money from banks and other organizations using a computer. The computer criminal works from home, using his own computer to gain access to the memories of the computers used by the banks and companies. The criminal tries to interfere with the computers in order to get them to transfer money to his computer without the bank or company knowing that it has been robbed. Computer crime like this, in fact, exists already. However, it's very difficult to carry out a successful robbery by a computer. Many computers have secret codes to prevent anyone but their owners from operating them. As computers are used more and more, it is likely that computer crime will become increasingly difficult to carry out. Nevertheless, a computer criminal may succeed now and then, and the detectives of the future will have to be highly skilled computer operators. There will probably be police computer fraud squads specially trained to deal with computer crime. Now, looking back to that, it is quite a realistic, spot-on prediction. And in fact, all around the world, each and every law enforcement agency these days have got a computer unit. Um, maybe not so much a computer criminal, but rather works like hackers is being used. Oops. Now let's go to the present day. Now it's 2011. IP version 4 is exhausted, and we are moving to IP. We recently had a world IP version 6 day. Um, the new buzzwords is cloud computing, 3G moving to 4G, deduplication with backups, Trojan horses, botnets, evil twins. And if I speak about an evil twin, I'm not referring to some people yesterday night after the braai. <laughs> I'm referring to the Wi-Fi sniffers. So um, I would like to tell you a little bit more about our unit and what we do. Basically, we focus on internet-related crimes where the computer is the target or where the uh, computer or devices are the instruments of the crime where the network or devices are incidental to other crimes. What is very important now, that we have moved away from a root analysis to see uh, what's going on on a computer. We are trying to trace from where attack, uh, attack came from and who's sitting behind it and what is the modus operandi of mostly an uh, organized syndicate. What, uh, why, what are they trying to gain? We, we try to, exp uh, to, to analyze the scripts that's being used for botnets, for example. Now, this is impossible for us to do be alone because the people out there is really smart. And we can't do it without the industry, internet service providers, and uh, other uh, government organizations. Now, if we look at the internet, what opportunities does the internet provide criminals to commit crime? 
While apart from physical and logical topology and architecture, internet also provides a psychological platform for criminals to operate on. Now, um, you all should be aware of Descartes and the whole concept of dualism. This always comes to mind to me if I look at computer criminals. I have a clear and distinct idea of myself as a thinking, non-extended thing, and a clear and distinct idea of body as an extended and non-thinking thing. Whatever I can conceive clearly and distinctly, God can so create. The mind, a thinking thing, can exist apart from its extended body, and therefore the mind is a substance distinct from the body, a substance whose essence is thought. So this idea of the separation and mind and body, people have been arguing for centuries. And if I can maybe just test, all the people or the audience who thinks the mind and body is one entity, can you please raise your hands? And, who, the, uh, and the ones that think it's uh, two different entities? Anybody thinks it's three entities? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So if you don't agree, don't worry. The people all have been arguing for about 500 years about it. But for me, when I sit in front of my computer, my mind and my body is separate. And I think some people here might also, I can see their bodies, but I don't know where their minds is going while they're sitting in front of their computer. But if I sit in front of my computer, I can be just who I want to be. I can be a beautiful blonde 16 year old girl or I can be 65 old male who tries to communicate with other maybe pedophiles and I would like now to introduce you to a true life story and this is Sean he also have an imaginative identity now for all the women out there and maybe some men also um, <laughs> I will give Sean a 10 out of 10. Look at a beautiful six pack, etc., etc. And they say women are not uh, visual. <laughs> um, now, this is Sean's Facebook profile. And um, uh, he was very kind to leave us a nice email address. And he is about, I think, 90 years old and single. And if you can have a look, he uh, has about two, 320 friends, all of them girls, between the ages of 13 and 16 years old. Most of them are in schools in Gauteng, mostly in Pretoria. Uh, we've identified about 28 schools. Now, um, I think you will, you will be very um, privileged if a guy like this asks you to befriend him. So what this guy did, he's, he started to lurk or flirt with the girls um, and asking them to send him, them photos of themselves in, in underwear, even naked photos. And then he also started to send them uh, uh, pictures from his webmail account. Um, that is really quite disgusting that I would really not like my 13-year-old child to see. So um, what we did, with the help of the internet service provider, we were able to identify the real person. And Shawnee didn't look at all as, um, <laughs> as he posted. He was actually very ugly, old, bald, with a huge, huge, <laughs> no, no six packs. Uh, it, it was, it was. <laughs> so um, yeah, and he was actually married for a year, and he also had two small children. We were also able to see, uh, to, uh, to analyze all the, uh, the information received from the service provider to see which children have been targeted. Another opportunity that cyberspace creates is uh, the irrelevance of ge ge geography. Uh, in cyberspace, birds of a feather, even those with highly unusual feathers, easily can flock together. For support groups devoted to helping people with their problems, that can be a very beneficial future of cyberspace. For people with antisocial motivations, that's a very negative 
future of cyberspace. And um, especially for people that work in, operate in syndicates, that makes it so much easier for them. Um, all kinds of syndicate groups, and I would like to share one example with you with regard to drug trafficking. Um, yes, there was a very, very interesting, like the geeks will say, a sexy program that was written, an application for an iPhone, which actually can turn your iPhone into a cartel phone. Um, this is an application that was used as a location-based multiplayer online role-playing game. This is very nice because it can bring the seller and the buyer. It can introduce them to each other. It's location-based. So if I need some um, cocaine, for example, in Cape Town, I can go on this nice application and I can see who is, who is the pushers there, who can provide the, the, the cocaine for me. And um, you can also see what is the supply and demand. So, um, and and I, maybe the seller can provide it in by a better, for a better price. And very cool about this program, it can also tell the, uh, the, 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 the role players if there's any cops in the vicinity. Um, I would like, I, I will just give you a small, quick um, uh, a video demonstration of how the program works. I just also have to mention that um, originally the program was called Drug Lords and they made mention of cocaine and marijuana, etc. But then they changed it to another name, Underworld Sweet Deals, where they now sell different kinds of sweets. Um, so, for example, cocaine became a lollipop, etc. So, um, if you can please play the clip for us. It all begins with repetition. Needles moving to the on position. Scraping glass as if it was a tradition. Leaving us with this chronic affliction. Let's Another thing that's very prominent is, of course, the, the selling of medicine. Um, for example, your Viagra and your steroids and all those kind of products that's available. Um, like you can see, it's very easy to, to buy uncontrolled medicine. Um, luckily, we also have some very sexy applications and tools that we can use um, that enable us to do uh, an, uh, to analyze the web. Um, where we can link different um, email addresses and websites, individuals, telephone numbers, in order for us to identify all the role players in the syndicate. Counterfeit drugs is very, very serious. According to the International Journal of Clinical Practice, people who buy fake internet drugs could be risking their lives and supporting terrorism. They say that harmful ingredients found in counterfeit medicines include arsenic, boric acid, leading road paint, floor and shoe polish, uh, chalk and brick dust and nickel. In one scheme, Americans buying fake Viagra on the internet were actually helping to fund Middle East terrorism, unknowingly jeopardizing the lives of men and women serving in their own armed forces. 
Medicines and healthcare products regulatory agencies estimate that nearly 62% of the prescribed only medicines offered on the internet without the need for a prescription are in fact fake. Now the question is, what is waiting for us for 2020? Is it possible to predict what is going to happen? I think if we look at the genius work of Rikers, well, what's waiting for us with the so-called singularity where the mind or the human and the machine might be one. And that might be a good thing, especially for the guys that likes to go for fishing, drinking, fishing, drinking, fishing and drinking because then they, they don't have to worry. They will have their wired network with them. But I'd like to read to you a possible prediction of what awaits us. By 2020, it is likely the whole concept of the internet and cybercrime may be passé, part of the dustbin or history. The greatest thing then might be the extreme difficulty of separating virtual cyber reality from physical reality. Perception, in fact, is more important than truth. Thus, if cyber reality is more convincing than physical reality, does the virtual world become the real world? And then we might ask ourselves, aren't every one of us sitting here a little avatar? Are we not, in fact, already living in a simulation? Thank you very much.